It's always amazing to me whenever uh, God moves and works and ar- arranges things in such a way, even when we're not planning it, that song that we just sang uh, perfectly goes along with what we have been learning in the book of Daniel. Uh, for the last about six weeks, we have been uh, going through the book of Daniel and, and uh, the various services that I, I've been preaching. If you've missed some of those, those are available online. But I have thoroughly enjoyed uh, going through this book of the Bible. And, and when I was praying about what to uh, preach uh, over the, the last several weeks, God really impressed upon my heart the relevance and the importance of going through this particular book of the Bible. When we look at Daniel, uh, he was a man of God at a young age who was taken out of his uh, home uh, country and, and transported into exile. And he found himself in a very ungodly and pagan area, uh, play, a place where he didn't understand the customs, he didn't understand the language, and there was tremendous, tremendous pressure placed upon him to conform into the idea of what these pagan ungodly cultures were wanting him to become. And as I thought through the the book of Daniel and, and how relevant it is for us today, I was just overwhelmed at how God can take his godly, pe- uh, his godly people who are trying to follow after him in an ungodly culture and do an amazing, amazing work. I'm convinced that we are living in a very troubling time. We are living in a, in a time where the world is increasingly trying to guide us away from God and conform us into what they think our lives should look like. If there was ever a time for the body of Christ to stand up, to speak out, and to represent the kingdom of God, it's today. We need to be the people of God as he has called us to in his word. And I believe that Daniel is a wonderful example of what that looks like. It's not easy. It's not simple. It's not black and white a lot of times. But if we stay faithful and and, and we trust in our Lord and Savior, he will guide us through any and every storm that comes our way. When we look at the book of Daniel, we have seen that there are a number of characteristics that Daniel and his friends exhibit in the face of exile. They were courageous. They were humble. They were men of integrity who stood firm for God's word. And so this is going to be the last part in this series, and I'm excited about this part because we're going to touch on an aspect of what it means to live in exile as people of God living in an ungodly culture. What, what do we need to do? What needs to characterize our life as we seek to live for God in this culture that is trying to lead us away from him? And I believe that one of the chief characteristics that need to define your life and my life in this day and time is integrity. We need to be people of integrity. Now that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but as I thought through this idea of integrity, what came to my mind is steel. When you look at steel and when you look at, uh, at how uh, hard and durable and what you can use it for, oftentimes you need to make sure that that steel that you're going to be using, whether it be for a building or a bridge or, or a car or whatever it needs to be, uh, that it has integrity, it has strength. It can stand up to the pressures and the wear and tear that it's going to be placed upon it. And I believe that is an apt description of the way we need to have, uh, the character that we need to have as people of God that we need to be made of the kind of stuff that can take the pressures of the world around us. But how do we do that? And what is that going to look like in our day-to-day life? And that's what I want us to spend our time here today looking at. So if you, ever have, your, if you have your copy of God's Word, I want you to turn to the sixth chapter, chapter of the book, the book of Daniel. And here in this chapter, we're going to come across a very uh, um, a well-known passage of Scripture, a well-known time in, in Daniel's life. Many of you have probably heard of this passage when you were just a child growing up in Sunday school or vacation Bible school about Daniel in the lion's den. But here's the thing that we need to keep in mind. And this is true not only of this passage, but all the book of Daniel. This passage is really not about Daniel. Just like the book of Daniel is not really about Daniel. It's about Daniel's God. 
It's about the kind of God that we just got done singing about, whose character is always faithful and always true. He is the way maker. He is the miracle worker. He was working in Daniel's life, and he works in the lives of imperfect people who are sold out to him. And so as we look in this uh, passage, and many, much of it is going to be familiar to you, again, don't lose sight of what this passage is really about. The God who lives and works in the lives of his people. And so we begin in chapter 6, starting in verse 1. There are going to be three characteristics about the integrity that we see in Daniel and the integrity that we need to see in each and every one of us. We start in verse 1. It says this, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps, and to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one. And the satraps might give an account to them so that the king would uh, suffer no loss. Going on to verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps, because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king gave thought to set him over the whole realm. So here we started in the book of Daniel, seeing that uh, Daniel was carried over into Babylonian captivity. But as we saw uh, just a few chapters before, uh, the uh, Medes and the Persians had come together and they had taken over Babylon. And now instead of uh, instead of Daniel being in the Medo, uh, I'm sorry, the Babylonian kingdom, he was in the Medo Persian kingdom, and Darius was reigning and ruling. And as any new king, uh, he Darius is wanting to make sure he can trust his officials. He is wanting to make sure. Uh, that he can admin, uh, be a good administrator to the kingdom. And so he sets up trustworthy individuals. And he has a, a bunch of satraps who are basically like governors all over the province of the kingdom. And then above those, he had Daniel and two other individuals. And what I want us to see here in these first few verses is that even amongst all the people of Babylon, even amongst all the Jews that were taken into uh, Babylon, even amongst all the Babylonians and the, the wise men and the officials who were in the king's court, Daniel rose above them all. Did you see in that passage what it was saying about Daniel? It said that he had distinguished himself above everyone else, and it said because there was an excellent spirit in him. That word spirit in the uh, Old Testament is a Hebrew word called ruach. And this ruach means it's the uh, animating force within us. It's this immaterial, in, uh, un, uh, untangible force that animates your words, your actions, the direction your life is going. And it's saying that Daniel's spirit, his character, the, anti, the animating force in his life was an excellent spirit. It was a good quality. It caused him to rise above the rest. Here's what we need to understand with Daniel, as well as with us, if we are wanting to be men and women of integrity for God's kingdom. That when we have integrity, when we are made of the stuff that can withstand the pressures around us as they push on us and then they try to conform us to their image, that if we hold true to what God's word says, if we hold to what is right and what is good, then we will stand out amongst those around us. Daniel stood out with those that are around him. When we look out at the world around us, we see that our world is constantly telling us that you need to fight for what you want. You need to uh, uh, push, fight, scratch, bite, do whatever you can to get ahead in life. If you need to stab someone in the back, you stab someone in the back. If you need to use and abuse people, you do whatever you need to do to get ahead and get what you deserve. That's the philosophy of the world. But in a world with that kind of a philosophy, is it any wonder why people who live not for themselves but live for someone else tend to stand out? To begin, uh, tend to go against the flow, tend to catch the attention of others. As Daniel constantly was being pressured by the, the pagan court around him, he decided, you know what, I'm not going to eat meat sacrificed to idols. You know what, I'm not going to bow down to your idols and to your statues. I'm not going to give in to all your pagan ways. I'm not going to repeat your pagan phrases. I'm going to live the life I live. I'm going to do a good job. I'm going to work hard in my place of business. I'm going to do right by my family. I'm going to do right by those who can't do well for themselves. I'm going to help them out and be generous and merciful. And when all the other people around them saw the way Daniel lived, they saw that there was something different. 
And as I read this passage and I think about the life of Daniel, I wonder, do the people around me, when they look at my life, when they look at the way I talk to my family, when they look at the way I interact with people around me in the church or out in the community, do they see something different in Jim? Is there something that stands out as something? Well, there's something peculiar. There's something off. He doesn't look at the world the way everyone looks. He doesn't, when hardships come, he doesn't react the way everyone else reacts. Is there something that causes you and me to stand out from the way of the world? You know, when uh, COVID-19 hit and when uh, the uh, economy uh, began to to, uh, take a turn for the worse and when it just seems like chaos after chaos with the riotings and everything else, it's so easy for us to get worried, to get scared, to wonder what's going to happen next, to maybe get depressed. But listen, that's the natural way that people act. But it should not be the way the people of God act. Because we know the one who holds the world in his hands. And when we look at Daniel, we see that here was an individual that even when he saw everything that he loved and cared about snatched away from him. The temple of God burnt. The people of God uh, uh, either killed, pillaged, or taken into exile. He still did not give up hope that God was still in control. That even though he may be in a, 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 a place of exile, he knew that God was reigning even in Babylon. And listen, that's true in the 21st century here in America as well. I don't care what's going on around us. I don't care what's going on in the news. Listen, God is in control, and we can trust in him. And when the world sees that we have peace and confidence in uncertain times, then they can see that there's something different about us. And there should be. We should stand out for God's glory and for the kingdom that he is bringing on this earth. Not only that, notice what it goes on to say. As Daniel is continuing to to, uh, be a witness and to stand out, we see in verse 4, it says, So the governors, the satraps, uh, ought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Here we see that Daniel, because he's standing out, he's not only attracted the attention of the king, but he's also attracted the attention of the other people who he is working with and caused jealousy among them. And so it says, but they could not find a charge or fault because he was faithful. Nor was there any error uh, error or fault found in him. Now notice what it says next. And if you highlight or you underline in your Bible, I just encourage you, mark this next line because this is just a wonderful testimony about the kind of man Daniel was. He says in verse 5, Then these men said, because they couldn't find a charge or an error or fault against Daniel, he says, We shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. Now imagine that for a moment. (laughs) Imagine that when people look at your life, and they're trying to see the little chinks in your armor. They're trying to see, well, he surely he can't be as, as good and godly as, as he makes that out to be. Surely she can't be as sweet and, and as kind and gracious as everyone says. And they try to find where your faults and, and, and the, the mistakes in your life are. The only thing they can find is that if we try to get him or we try to get her to do something against their God. What if the only thing that people can find wrong with you is that you don't do the things like everyone else, that you don't go with the customs with everyone else, that you don't fudge on your uh, tax reports like anyone else, that you don't tell lies like anyone else, that if they wanted to get you in trouble with the boss, if they wanted to get you in trouble with someone else, they're going to have to pit the world standards against the standards of your God. When they looked at Daniel... They said, the only way we're ever going to get the king to go against Daniel, the only way we're ever going to find any fault is if we convince the king to put some law on the books that pits the world against his God. Because we know that Daniel's allegiance isn't primarily to the king, it's to the God that he serves. Would that that would be our character as well. That the only way that anyone's going to find anything against us is if we have to choose God against someone else or something else. 
Listen, I've said this before and I'll say it again. I am so incredibly thankful to live in this country that we have. We have freedoms uh, that uh, many people can only imagine and dream about. We have privileges and we have comforts that that, um, most people throughout the uh, whole human history could not even fathom. But listen, as proud as I am to be an American, first and foremost, I'm a follower of Christ. First and foremost, my allegiance is to God. And I pray that our country will have many, many more years ahead of us where where we are uh, enjoying the freedoms that God has given us. But if there ever comes a time where we have to choose between being an American or being a Christian, I pray for myself, for my family, and for my brothers and sisters in Christ that we, without hesitation, choose Christ every single time. Because our home is not here on this earth as it is. Our home is with Christ Jesus. And we are to follow him even if that means taking up our cross and surrendering our life. Now, I, I, please understand me. I don't know what I would do in a situation like that. My prayer is that I would follow Christ. There are Christians all around the world today, even as we sit here worshiping God in the comfort of this sanctuary, that are having to lay down their life for the cause of Christ. And I pray that I would be able to be one of them, but I don't know. My hope is through the grace of God I would be. But you know, if we are going to be that kind of Christian that not only stands up and stands out in the midst of an ungodly world, but also is willing to lay down everything to follow Christ. If we're to have that kind of integrity, it doesn't begin in the hardships. It begins right now in the comforts. It begins now while we have opportunity to to grow in Christ and to, to fellowship with believers in Christ. Don't wait until your back's against the wall to begin make, uh, making hard stances and decisions for Christ. Do that now. Begin building within you the character that we see here in Daniel. You know, when we first see Daniel in chapter 1, he was just a young boy. Most scholars believe he was probably just a teenager. But he was willing to say, you know what? I'm not going to eat that meat sacrificed to idols. I don't know what's going to happen to me, but I'm going to follow God. Let the chips fall where they may. You see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who say, you know what? We're not going to bow down to this idol. And if you throw us into the fiery furnace, our God can save us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship this idol. They didn't wait until the laws were passed, until their backs were against the wall. They were men of character because they consistently, day by day, moment by moment, were making decisions of integrity. Decisions to follow and honor their God. I don't know what decisions you've been making in your life here lately. I don't know what your past is. I don't know what pressures you may be facing now. But listen, now is the moment that God is trying to strengthen you, test you, refine you in the fire of the decisions and trials and tribulations that you're facing so that you will be able to face even greater trials ahead for his glory as he makes you more and more into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. So we see that these uh, governors and these satraps were trying to plot against Daniel. And so they go to the king and they say, King, listen, you're wonderful, you're great, you're amazing. And they pour all this flattery on the king and they say, Listen, we think you're so amazing. Here's what we think you should do, king. We want you to put a law on the books that for the next few days we want no one to pray to any god or anyone except to you. Well, of course, that just boosted the king's pride. He thought, well, that sounds nice. A whole kingdom, basically the whole known world at that time, praying to me over the next few days. I love that. That sounds wonderful. Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. And so they put it on the books, and the the governors and the satraps, they say, well, wait a second, king, just make sure. Just know, whenever you put this law on the books, by our customs, a law is a law, and even the king is held to it. Once it's on the books, that's it. You can't do anything about it. He said, I know, that sounds good. Let's do this. Let's put this law in the books. And so that's what he did. And then Daniel finds out about it. And that's where I want us to look real quick. Look in verse 10 of this chapter. And I want you to see the character and the integrity here of Daniel. It says, now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, that's this law that, that Darius had just passed, he went home. And in his upper room, With his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave, catch this, thanks before his God, as was his custom since early 
days. I love that. There is so much in that one passage right there. Three times a day, as soon as he heard this news that basically, Daniel, you can't worship your God over this next period of time. You can't worship your God. You can't pray to him. You have to pray to this uh, king. Daniel goes home and he prays three times that day. And not only does he pray, he gives thanks to God. And I don't know about you. I'm, I'm just going to uh, 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 be open and honest and just reveal a little bit about who I am for just a second. If I knew that today, before we were to go home, that there was a law that was just passed here in the United States that said, you know, you cannot pray. No one can pray in the United States for the next 30 days. And if you do pray, then you're going to immediately go to jail. My inclination would be to pray. It would, I would stress. I would worry. I would pray. I don't know if I would be giving thanks in that moment. I would be begging God for mercy. I would be begging God to change the law. I would be asking and praying and, and asking other people to pray. I would be staying up all night praying, maybe even running to the hills and praying and trying to hide. But I would not go back to my house with the windows open for all the world to see and pray as my custom, giving thanks to God. What in the world is Daniel giving thanks for? Now, we're not told in the text, but I just, I just imagine that maybe what Daniel is thanking God for is who God is. Because you know what? Even though Daniel's circumstances have changed, God didn't. God was still the same God he had always been. He was the same God who led Daniel into exile. He was the same God who protected Daniel throughout his exile. And he was the same God that Daniel was going to worship here and throughout the rest of his life. Most scholars believe that at this point, Daniel is probably about 80 years old. He has been in exile for most of his life, serving faithfully his God and his king. But when the two are at odds, he's going to choose God every time. And he's going to thank God for the life that he's been given. He's going to thank God for what he's already done in his life. And he's going to thank God no matter what happens in the days ahead. Listen, that's the kind of integrity we need as the people of God. That regardless of what happens, regardless of what uh, we find out on the news tomorrow, regardless of what happens in our personal life and in our family life in the days ahead, we can still praise God. Not because he's doing uh, uh, enjoyable, comfortable things in our life, but because he's God and he deserves it. So we should praise him no matter what. In the good times, we praise him. In the bad times, we praise him because he deserves it. And that's what Daniel does, and that's the kind of integrity that's going to see us through those difficult moments in life, those difficult seasons of life, where it seems like we can't see God's hand moving, we don't know what he's doing and why he's bringing us into this situation. We still praise him. And again, don't miss what it said there at the very end, as was his custom from early days. He didn't wait until this moment to start praying. Listen, if you get sick, if your finances begin to fail, if the world just falls apart around you, don't wait for that moment to start praying. Start praying today. And begin developing that habit that, you know, the most important thing, the most important moment of my day is when I go before the throne of God and I talk to him. Why in the world do I and why in the world do we oftentimes, so oftentimes, let lesser things crowd out the most important thing in our day? Listen, the prayers of God's people change and shape the world around us. God moves on behalf of his people praying. We see that in Daniel. We see that throughout uh, biblical history and world history. You have an incredible influence on what God is doing in the world. Don't lose sight of that. Go before your heavenly Father. Maybe you have been neglecting your time with God. Listen, we serve a gracious God. I don't always pray as much as I need to, but I'm so thankful that the moment that God stirs my heart to begin going towards him, he's right there waiting for me. Not to give me a guilt trip, not to make me feel bad about the times that I've neglected my time with him, but to say, welcome back. I've been looking forward to spending some time with you. If you've been neglecting your time with God, today's the day to begin moving back in his direction and talking to your heavenly father. So Daniel, he's praying before God. And then it says this in verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication 
before his God, and they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who pays petition uh, to any God or man within uh, the 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, this is true according to the laws of the Medes and Persians, which do not alter. So they answered and said before the king that Daniel, who is the one of the captives of Judah, does not show due regard to you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but he makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. uh, Then these men approached the king and said to him, O king, know that this is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no decree or statue which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the lion's den. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, You, uh, your God, whom you serve continually, will deliver you. Then a stone was brought, and laid at the mouth of the, of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the uh, signets of his lords that the uh, purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now I want to pause here for just a moment. We, most of us know where this story is going. Daniel's been cast into the lion's den. It's been sealed. We know, uh, most of us know that at the end of this, God rescues Daniel. But I want to pause here for just a moment. Even though we know how the story ends, In the moment, Daniel didn't know how the story was going to end. He didn't know how God was going to rescue him. He didn't know uh, what God was going to do, if God was going to allow him to be devoured by these lions or whether God was going to rescue him. But there's nothing in the text that suggests that he ever wavered for a moment. And so I just want to pause here for a moment because there's a temptation for many Christians who read this and say, okay, this is great. If we live with integrity, if we're in the midst of an ungodly world, if we continue to pursue God, yes, hard times will come, but God will rescue us. God will protect us. And I would love nothing more to stand here and say, yes, absolutely. You follow God. You do what he has called you to do, and he'll watch over you. He will protect you. He will provide for you. And often, oftentimes he will. But there are other times that he won't. And if you look throughout uh, church history, you look throughout uh, just the circumstances and situations that are going on all around the world, there are many Christians, men, women, and children, who are suffering the loss of their job, the loss of their families, the loss of their life because of their stand for Christ. And I can't begin to imagine or, or explain why God allows his people to suffer the, the way that they do But there are times where God, he protects, he provides, he miraculously delivers, and then there are other times he doesn't. But again, if we are to be people of integrity, we don't follow God just in the times that we know he's going to come through for us. If we see anything from the book of Daniel, we see that oftentimes he'll bring us right to the edge of disaster before in his perfect time and in his perfect way, he steps in. And shows up and shows out as only he can. But even if he doesn't, my prayer is that I and that my brothers and sisters in Christ would be people who say, you know, even if he doesn't deliver me, I'm going to thank God, I'm going to praise God, and I'm going to continue following him to my dying day. That should be our desire. That should be our calling. We don't know the end of our story. But we know the one who's writing our story. We know the one who has charted our course and we're going to trust in him even when we don't see the end because we trust in the one who's walking with us throughout it all. So we see here at the uh, verse 19, it says, Then after uh, uh, the king had stood up basically all night worrying, uh, stressing, wondering what was going to happen to Daniel, it says this in verse 19, Then the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. 
because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. Then the king was exceedingly glad for him. And he commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatsoever was found on him because he believed his God. Now notice what it says here in verse 24. And the king gave command and he brought all those men who had accused Daniel and he cast them into the lion's den. Them, their children, and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of of the din. And I know that sounds really harsh. How, how in the world could that happen? You know, it was just the, these men. But listen, there's just a, a little principle here that I want us to see. It's just a little side note, but it's an important one. That does sound horrible. But listen, my, decision, my decisions affect more than just me. And your decisions affect more than just you. When I do uh, when I step outside of God's will and I do things contrary to his will, listen, it affects my family. It affects my church. It affects those around me. And we may not like it, but that's the way the world works. That's the way things work. And we need to understand that we need to be people of integrity because our decisions, our choices, our words and our actions have consequences, not just to me, but to those around me. Daniel knew that just as much as anyone else. Notice what it says here in verse 28, and we'll end on this. Verse 28 says this, So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And when it says here that uh, he's prospering, we know that he is rising up in ranks even at the age of 80. Daniel continues to live his life, rising to the top, standing out from those around him, and being blessed by God. Is that a guarantee that you'll always be blessed? No, obviously not. But here's what I do want you to understand about integrity. If you live for God and you resist the pressure of the world to conform into what they want, but instead you are transformed into the image of Christ Jesus, you'll stand out from those around you. You'll stand out in your workplace. You'll stand out with your neighbors. You'll stand out even amongst uh, members of your church family. When people are reflecting the glory of God as they are walking in fellowship with him, we can't help but to draw attention to that. Jesus says when he is lifted up, all eyes will be gathered to him. Listen, when people see Christ in you, they're not looking at you, they're looking at him. Would we be men and women of integrity? And when we stand up and we stand out, listen, we're going to attract the attention that may bring blessings into our life, but we're also going to be attracting the attention of people who want to uh, uh, rob us of those blessings and persecute us. But if we are truly men and women of integrity, that will not affect our walk with Christ Jesus. If anything, it will solidify our commitment to follow him even through the storms of life. That's my prayer for you. Don't wait until the trials come your way. It begins right now. It begins here as we set our mind to follow him no matter what. When we commit that above any and everything else, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I hope that's your desire. If you are here today and you want to have that kind of uh, commitment, you want to have that kind of relationship with Christ where it trumps everything else, listen, if you have not made that decision, I pray that you will ask God into your heart today, that you'll commit to following him. If you're already a Christ follower, you have already been following Christ for, for many years, listen, I pray that you, each and every day you will renew that commitment to put him first and foremost above everything else. Listen, our world is only going to get more chaotic and more dark as time goes on. That's what God's word says. But the people of God shine the brightest in the midst of a dark world. Follow God and watch him use your life to bring untold glory to him and expand his kingdom to the ends of this earth. In just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation. My prayer is that you go before your heavenly father, thank him for what he's already done and who he is in your life, and then ask him to make you a man or a woman of God with integrity for the days ahead. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Wonderful Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your mercy, which is new each and every day. Father, if you never did a single thing for the rest of our lives, Lord, we could still praise you for what you have already done. Lord, you have blessed beyond measure. Lord, thank you for that. 
Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us, your commitment to us, Lord, that you are always true. Lord, you are always there even when we run away and when we chase after lesser things. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. And Father, I pray that we would rest in you. Pray that we would rest in Christ Jesus. And Lord, that you would continue to renew in us a steadfast heart that follows hard after you no matter what's going on around us. Father, I pray that our church, the Highland Park Baptist Church, would be known as a church of integrity. Lord, a church that, Lord, keeps its eyes fixed and focused on you. And Lord, that that we would stand out amongst this community. And Lord, that people would be drawn to you as we lift you high. Lord, do your will in this time of invitation. Lord, lift your name high and bring people to yourself. And Lord, accomplish your eternal work in this place. And we ask this all in Christ's wonderful, holy, and gracious name. Amen.